This is the Parallax Podcast, and my name is Thomas Mark. In this mini series, I interview the Swedish philosopher Alexander Barth on his worldview in general and his book Digital Libido in particular. Alexander Barth is a colorful character, being a proper philosopher, shaman, pop star, and entrepreneur. But as a shaman philosopher, he looks deeply into our past, present, and future laying out new narratives on the digital era, which is just now unfolding. In this five-part mini-series, we will explore some of his core ideas. We start with a general introduction, followed by lectures on the relationship between man and technology, the phallus, spirituality and power. In which sequence you listen to these episodes is completely up to you. This is a new format. I try to take a back seat and only facilitate guiding questions so Alexander Barth had all the space to express and reveal his ideas. All the recordings took place in midst of the worldwide corona pandemic, which is quite obvious right now, but could create a context for the listeners in the years to come. Because the internet won't forget. So, enjoy this mini-series, and if you indeed enjoyed it, please share it. So, today, Alexander, we are talking about phallus. Let's talk about phallus. Yes, yes. so yeah. the, the thing I, I wanted to start with is, uh, you certainly have heard of Spiral Dynamics, you have heard of um, Suzanne cook -Reuter. and when, when they're modeling the different stages of development, say, in, uh, psychologically or socially, so they distinguish between those stages who are more like communal driven, right? And more the stages who are more agency driven, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I was reading a Digital Libido and you were talking about Phallus and uh, Mamilla, I was kind of reminded to that duality of stages who are like female driven and stages who are like more male agency driven. But in the book Digital Libido, you employ mostly like a Freudian frame of reference and so i think the, yes. the, the the first question would be like how before delving into the the, the core of the matters like how, why did you choose to you know use a freudian frame of reference for for that book and for that you know for that kind of description for that kind of um well it's because this is how human beings operate <laughs> so freud was uh closer to the truth than I think he even understood himself. So in a sense, you could say that Sertichrist and I are more Freudian than Freud himself was. That, that's the way I look at it. Uh, what's interesting with our method is that we are actually using three genital organs here, out of which two are placed on the female body. We should say that first before we talk about phallus. Uh, we are not too preoccupied with the anus compared to Freud. So he was more anal, you know. Uh, but we are very preoccupied with the matrix and the, with the mamilla and with the phallus. And what we mean by that is that we all come out of the matrix and in a way we all return to the matrix. So the matrix or the womb symbolizes birth and death. It's the origin. And what we talk about is that it's really important to stress that the first nine months before we're born that we spend inside the womb are also the nine months we long back to whenever we think of things like paradise or perfection or a world without problems or like being in an ecstatic state where nothing is problematic and we're just glorious and things like that. So, so all the stages we think of later in life as being ecstatic are actually reminding us of the first nine months because, because in the womb we don't have any problems and precisely because we don't have any problems to solve, we cannot have a sense of self. I think that's rather fascinating. You know, existence in itself, if it would be totally unproblematic, would not contain a sense of self. Self-consciousness is part of problem solution, problem solving. It's not actually in itself given existentially. So what then happens is that we're born and birth is obviously the worst experience we ever have. That's why we can't remember it, thank God. Uh, we, we don't talk about rebirth in our work because we think it's a ridiculous idea to be reborn. You don't want to be reborn. Once right. you've been born, you don't ever to be born again. So you forget about it, thankfully. And what happens is that it is, it is to understand 
logically what happens after you're born. You had nine months in heaven. You went through temporary hell. The worst hell you're probably ever going to go through. Uh, you also had heaven taken away from you. So what would be the first reaction once you're born? It'd be something like, I want to die. <laughs> because dying is what you came from. You were dead. Yourself, your sense of self was dead while you existed in right. the womb. You don't have any other sense of death. You don't, you don't have any sense of ceasing to exist or anything like that. There's no sense of that kind of death. Death is basically not existing at all consciously. So it's, it's lack of self conscience. It, 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 there's no consciousness there. So you actually come from death in that sense and you arrive in a shocking state of, you know, urgency. And um, what we then say is that you're actually met by smile, very likely. That smile is not your mother's smile and certainly not your father's smile. It's probably not even the room. But you're met by the smile of the matriarch. So the first other being we encounter when we're born is the matriarchal gaze. So this is usually a midwife or some other clever woman of the tribe who, who would then, who would then you know, embrace us and take us out of the womb. And, and you know, there'd be a smile there. So it's kind of confusing. You go through hell, you're met with a smile. And the only way you can react to that is that you want to go back into the complete belonging and reconnection with the world so you don't have to exist on your own. And this is what automatically happens. This is where psychologists, psychiatrists, and psychoanalysts all agree. The first thing the baby, newborn baby does automatically is to crawl to the breast. And this is why we introduced the mamilla as a very, very important aspect that psychoanalysis ignored way too much. The only of the prominent psychoanalysts to really talk a lot about mamilla is Julia Kristeva, the French Bulgarian the female psychoanalyst who wrote a couple of brilliant books in the 1970s and the 1980s. She, she's definitely one of the major post-structuralists next to Deleuze and Foucault and Derrida. You have to read Kristeva. She's wonderful, right? And she writes about the mamilla and about the tit. And, and we call it the mamilla because it's a Latin word for mama is breast in Latin. Mamilla is the small breast. So, so we make the psychoanalytical term for the breast different from the, the distinctive medical term for the breast. So that's mama, we call it the mamilla. So we, we don't say womb, we say matrix, which is Latin. We don't say mama, we say mamilla. So we go from the matrix to the mamilla. Now, this is the first year of our lives because what happens is as soon as you suck the mamilla, as a baby, you feel unified with the mother's body again. So the mother and the child are not separated. They're unified again. Not for the mother. The mother's just experienced that she's given birth to the baby. So for the mother, the mother and the child are separate, but the intense love that the mother feels by giving the milk to the baby when the baby's sucking the breast gives an intense feeling of unification, but not literal unification. For the, for the mother, it's a spiritual unification, but for the baby, it is a literal unification. It's very, very important to understand that this is what the mamilla means to the mother. This is what the mamilla means to the baby. Now, the mamilla is the absolute center of our existence. It is the first object. It exists before we even exist. So somewhere between that experience, the birth itself, and about a year into the child's life, Something happens about a year into the child's life. Um, mamilla's at the center, but something becomes uneasy about sucking the tit about a year into the experience. A medical doctor would say it's because your first tooth exists and suddenly gets a bit irritating to suck the tit. You know? So that, that's like a signal of you should get prepared to not suck the tit any longer. But psychologically speaking, that means you have to push away the mamilla from you. We, we always assume, before Chris Deva, we always assume that it was the mother who eventually took the baby away from the tit. But what Chris Deva, as a really great woman, as almost like a spiritual midwife tells us, is that, no, the woman does not have any reason at all to push away the child. There is no psycho, psycho, psychological or psychoanalytical or even physiological function of the woman that makes her push away the baby from her. She represents unconditional love. The matrical love, the love from the mother to the child is unconditional. I love you no matter what. Okay? So I love you for who you are, not in any way for what you do. 
Now, at about one year of age, something really weird happens. You know, literally it could be, you know, father or some other man who walks by with a large penis. So it's like the male grown-up adult body that becomes present to the child. To the boy, it becomes some kind of competition, according to, the Fro to Freud. To the girl, it becomes, uh, the mother's body becomes competition to the girl because obviously the magical gaze from the mother no longer looks down on you when you're sucking the tit. The magical gaze suddenly looks at something else that <coughs> you're attracted to. And that is the phallus, right? So the woman being attracted to the phallus is like weird for the child and miraculous and you know, a big hassle. Like, how are you going to deal with this? So what Freud says, in a fundamental sense, is that the boy wants the phallus, the girl wants to have the phallus inside of her. In a fundamental sense. Okay, if you're a lesbian or a gay guy, just reverse it. No problem at all. It's the same thing. So there is an intimate relationship between the child and the mamilla, and there's a distant relationship suddenly between the child and the phallus. And the phallus becomes attractive. It's something the child's being pulled towards. This is where the story of the phallus always starts. It starts about one year of age into our lives. When we achieve an identity, there's neither the mamilla nor the phallus. Mamilla is want to get away from, the phallus we want to come towards. We want to grab the phallus and get closer to it, but we can't. So it's the first time in our life we've really denied something that we really want. And this kick starts both drive and desire. And of course, psych psychoanalysis operates around drive and desire. And drive and desire are different because drive is what kick starts our fantasy, our imagination. So it's what we fantasize about. But the desire kick starts the urge for language and words and the magic of words. And after that, we start to fantasize about the world of desire and the world of desire is always the desire for an object that we'd like to put a name on or it, 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 the desire for an object we hear a story about it, that, that's what desire does whereas drive is much more mechanistic and, it, and it's the actual fantasy about having access to the phallus and what it represents what does but, it represent okay good question what does it represent it represents the grown-up world not because your mother isn't grown up but it's because your mother represents where you come from and because your mother represents your birth, your mother represents unconditional love and your mother represents the mamilla that gives you milk and gives you everything you need and has protected you and sacrificed itself. The, 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 the mother's body has sacrificed itself for you if necessary for you to live. So it's something you're leaving. So it's younger than you. Whereas the phallus represents the magical world that mother's gaze is attracted to. The magical world of the grown-ups out there. So for the first time in our life, if this phallic intrusion works as it should, when the phallic intrusion happens, we have the first urge in our lives to one day become a grown-up. And this is exactly when childhood starts. And childhood is full of mimicking the grown-ups. I want to be like dad. I want to be like mom. I want to be like men. I want to be like women. I want to have heroes. I want to have heroines. I, I want to be like the grown-up world because the grown-ups have a fantastic world that is magical, and powerful, and it's so different from the sort of abysmal little tiny world that I live in as a child. So it kickstarts this whole process that I want to grow up. And hopefully then, yeah. And hopefully but at the same time, a, yeah. at the same time, you could argue that if you look at the world we are living in now, it is an adult world. While in reality, in this postmodern world, there is a rejection of phallus. So not every grown-up world is necessarily a, a phallic world. So how would you solve that riddle? That's why we're fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> the phallic intrusion should work. So if you ask psychologists, if you ask, ask psychiatrists, if you ask psychoanalysts. So if you approach the human mind both from the medical perspective, scientific perspective, or you approach it from, from the sort of social science perspective, or you pr pr approach it from the philosophical perspective. That's what psychology, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis do. The three different perspectives approaching the human mind. What they all agree on is that the phallic intrusion has to work. If it doesn't work, you need to compensate for it quickly. And if it doesn't work at all, you're fucked. Because it's the beginning of a long journey where eventually you biologically arrive in adolescence. And when you arrive in adolescence, you biologically get the large penis, you get the vagina, you get the breast, and suddenly you, you're getting to have a grown-up body. And that kickstarts the adolescent 
teenage years, when you go through, like, how do I react to the body, which is already grown up, and my mind, which isn't grown up yet, and that throws you forward to which in, what in all cultures happen somewhere between 18 and 20 years of age, which is called the rite of passage, usually the initiation ritual. And after the initiation ritual, you become a grown up, and, and young men go off to do certain things, and young women go off to do certain things. For this whole process to work, the phallic intrusion has to work when you're one years old. If that doesn't work, you're pretty screwed up. And what we've done in our society is we just prolonged all these processes. We prolonged the first year of our lives. And it lasts for three or four or five years before we approach something that even remotely starts to look like a phallic intrusion. And even then it isn't very phallic because the men aren't being very phallic around you. The grown-ups are behaving like children. And, and, and then when you come to, when your biology still kicks in when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you're not prepared for that at all. And that the teenage years are prolonged. So give some and, examples of phallic behavior. So when you're phallic, you're a grown up. I mean, yeah, but uh, what does it, what does it mean? I mean, like if I I, I could I could say uh, if you're phallic, you're um, um, you um, you can work with hierarchies, for example. Yes. Right? So you can uh, work with limitations. Yes, you can you can uh, uh, accept your limitations and strive for more. You can yeah. conquer chaos in a way. You exactly. Can, so the point, the point, you're absolutely right. The point here is, I said, unconditional love is the magical love from the mother's body. What father then represents, or phallic gaze represents, that the phallic gaze is the gaze of a judge. So when you get tired of hearing that you're fantastic, no matter what you do, that's also what happens after you've left the mamilla and you can eat for yourself. You start walking on your own. You start crawling and walking on your own. And, and you want to protest against your mother and you, you, you want to challenge your father. And you want to see if you can handle things on your own. You say, no, I can do this myself. You're three years old, right? All these protests that you do as a child, you experiment, you mimic the parents and you experiment to try to find your own identity in that process. You're desperate to find somebody who tells you whether you're good at it or whether you're bad at it or not. And not somebody who tells you all the time you're wonderful no matter what happens. Because you've got to have a, a reward system now tied to your actual behavior. So how you think, how you talk, how you behave, and especially, you know, especially how, how this whole package is being presented to you. You're looking for something called the phallic gaze. So this is the birth of the phallic gaze. So what we fantasize about is about a different gaze than the mom we got from the mother, which was unconditional love. This is the love that is conditional. Not so much that we're loved conditionally, but rather that the, the gaze looks at the world first and then tells us what we need to do to work within that world. So this world, this gaze takes you into the world and the, the gaze lovingly, lovingly tells you, no, you can't do that. Or that wasn't very well done. Or you're being lazy. Or no, you can't just rush this over. That's not our works. You've got to go back and do this better. So these feedback loops that we so desperately look for, they come from the phallic gaze. So the first thing the phallus represents is a grown-up world that we as a child think is perfect because it's grown-up although it isn't, but we, don't, we haven't figured that out when we're three years old. It rather is a world that we try to mimic as desperately as possible. And at this stage, we need to find out we're not perfect. We don't need to find out the grown-ups are not perfect. We need to find out we're not perfect so we can work on improving ourselves. That is what phallus represents to the well, child. Well, additionally, we have to distinguish between that and um, the, the false phallus where you can authentically, in a kind of way, enact being a good judge or, you know, or distinguish, make distinct distinctions, being strong in the world and enact and embody that kind of strength mm. or to, to mimic that behavior without being that. Is that something... Did yeah, I get that? yeah we, we do have problems with authentic versus fake fallacies already with children. We can have a really terrible dad or, or you know, you know, it can, be, it can be pretty fucked up. Let's put it that way. Let's be honest about it. Childhood can be a very fucked up process. But I'm talking about sort of an ideal process when this seems to work pretty well, when people are not being fucked up by it. So the phallic intrusion happens at one year of age. You go through different stages throughout childhood. We don't have to go into those right now because it's part of child psychology. But when you do come into your teenage years, uh, then what you do between your body has become a grown-up before your mind is ready to be grown-up. So between... 
the arrival of adolescence and your actual rite of passage. That's about five years or six years, usually a bit longer for the boys than the girls. But you know, when you go from being a boy to a man and go from girl to becoming a woman. Now, this is when you start trying your parents. And that's when you discover your parents are not perfect. And they have limitations. So what you do essentially is that you mimic your parents so much, you mimic their ideal. It's like, okay. My dad and my mom and the grown-ups around me pretended to be this and this and this. So they were authentic mamillas and they were authentic matrixes and they were authentic fathers. They were authentic women, authentic men. Of course they weren't. So we tried them really, really hard and we tried to be perfection and we discover they're not and we go after them big time. So we can go free from our parents and free from them so we can become fully grown-ups on our own. And that's what the rite of passage does. So what the rite of passage says is that the elders in the tribe step forward, not your parents, and they welcome you to the other side. You are now a fully grown up young man. You are now a fully grown up young woman. You're ready to take responsibility. You've done the whole process. You've succeeded. And you achieve the proper phallic gaze on the other side, which is the gaze of the elders. This is that you're okay. By the way, not, now it's where your next journey is start. Your adult journey starts here. You want to be like me. You want to be an elder one day. Before that, you want to become a parent or, or, right. or you want to take responsibility. You want to become a teacher or a leader. Certainly, you want to excel at what you're good at. You want to find your archetype, a primary archetype. You possibly also want to find your secondary archetype, meaning your primary archetype is what you're really good at and should do what you have talent for. That's usually what your, your primary education as well. Your secondary archetype is what you're good at and can do if it's needed. Right. So you're like, you're an extra reservoir for the tribe and you could take responsibility for that if needed. So you need, getting these archetypes, we try to reconstruct today in our work that you should get from the elders of your community again because that would make you a proper grown-up. Now, this is all part of the authentic phallus and authentic matrix, meaning it's authentic female and male leadership. The elders are both matriarchs and patriarchs, and men and women have been around. Usually they're over 50 years old, they've had children, or they've taken part in the responsibility of raising children. Somehow they've been parental, as we call it. They've, 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 they've gone through a phase of parentality. What we use the term parentality in our work is that because you don't necessarily have to be the mom or the, or the, or the dad biologically. Children are raised collectively by the entire community. That's how it's worked historically and should work. The nuclear family is a terrible idea. Children just are more than one mom. Children just are more than my dad. And because they have several parents around them and they also co-raise themselves as children and they co-raise themselves as adolescents and they also go through right of passage together. It's a collective effort, right? It's a tribal effort. Once you go through the right of passage, then you're ready to become a young man or a young woman and take responsibilities. That's when your adult journey starts. And this is when the authentic direction gets even more important. Because if we don't have authentic leadership at that stage, then we are so pre-programmed to look for older leadership that we will go for the false leadership instead. A right. perfect example of that is if you don't find somebody to lead you when you're 20 years old, you are ripe material for a really terrible guru who runs a terrible sect to just pick you up with a crazy story about himself. And, and then you get absorbed by it and you believe it and it takes you 30 years to get out of it and shit like that. So we're really vulnerable when we're around 20 years old. So biologically, we should go through the rite of passion. We're actually, we actually, you know, we, we, we kicked out our parents our lives and we're on our own. And we at best maybe have a couple of, you know, brothers or sisters our own age. That's exactly when, you know, if you grew up in a Muslim community, you used to become an Islamist. That's when, you, if you grew up in Germany, France, or Italy in, in the early 1970s, you know, when Maoism was popular and Marxist Leninism and what is his word staged, and you could have joined, you know, you know the, the guerrilla groups that threw up bombs in, in, in Germany and in France and Italy in the 1970s, and you, had, you were a terrorist, right? So... It's very, very easy, specifically when you're around 19, 20 years old, to get hijacked by anybody. This is, of course, when Adolf Hitler hijacked right. all the guys that joined him and joined the Nazi party and the SA and the SS. This is, of course, when Lenin and Stalin, especially Stalin, hijacked you know, young men and women to join the Communist Party of Russia and then the Soviet Union and, and started Stalinism. This is, of course, with Mao Zedong, both when he started his revolution in China in the 1940s, and even worse, 
when Mao was about to lose power in the 1960s and returned to a new young generation and manipulated them to go out and even kill their own parents during the Maoist Cultural Revolution of China, one of the worst incidences in human history, a mass slaughter. So what is important about our age today is to understand how vulnerable young people are for these weird messages coming from the fake fallacies when the authentic leadership is not around. Right. Uh, just give me a second, yeah. um, because um, maybe you have an answer for that. So if, if we talk about Mamilla and Matrix, and you said like the, the core, the archetypal core essences are like, like unconditional love, maybe tolerance, stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, how would you pinpoint like the, the essence may, may not be the right word, but like the main, the core idea of the phallus? If it's say if, if unconditional love is more the thing of the mamilla, you know, mm -hmm. and for, from the mother, from the female side, what's the what's the core essence of of being an authentic phallus? Okay, and how, to, how to, would you pin? Yeah. What is it? You know. Okay, the the two phalluses, and, and there's only one matrix, but I'll discuss that. Uh, the first thing is the phallic gaze loves reality first, so the phallic gaze can only come from somebody who accepts reality. We talk about Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of amor fati here. Only the grown-up person who accepts reality as it is. And it doesn't so the, 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 the mamilla can't do that? The, no, the, the, ma the mamilla represents the fantasy and the fairy tale. The right. fairy tale that everything is always okay. The right. fairy tale there's always milk available to you. But when you discover that the mother's body cannot give you milk through the mamilla unless somebody else feeds the mother. Again, that's phallus. It's usually a bunch of men out there who work hard to make a living so that the mother's body can be fed so that the mother can then feed you the milk. And if it's not directly a father these days, it's usually a father who works hard somewhere out there and then pays taxes. And then the taxes come through the state to the mother's body and then the mother's body can still pay for the bills so that the breast or the mamilla is full. Milk. But you as a child discover, oh, there's a bigger process out there. There's a more complex reality out there. The mamilla just didn't just magically supply the milk to me. It came from somewhere. Okay, where is that? That's the same kind of process, discovering that the mother loves somebody else that isn't me. And the mother loves some, something else that I cannot give her, which is phallus. So phallus always represents that which the child itself cannot produce. Right that somebody else produces that value and the child is completely dependent on it because everything the child is dependent on, for example, its own survival, comes originally from the phallus. So the phallus represents the origin of that. The matrix represents the origin of existence itself. The phallus represents the origin of the support system for that existence once you exist. Right. So we call that outer circuit and inner circuit. The inner circuit is symbolized by the matrix. That's where we come from. The outer circuit is symbolized by the support system for the inner circuit and thereby for ourselves. Right. So the phallic case has to come from somebody credibly loves reality as it is and accepts it. And because the phallic case first looks at reality and understands how reality works, no matter how hard or how tough or how challenging the world is, it accepts reality first and then looks at you. It places you within that reality. So it will only tell you what's good for you, depending on the circumstance, depending on reality you live in. I don't want to, I, I don't want to be leading here yeah. with, uh, um, uh, or, or, or push you in a, in a certain direction. But what, what comes to mind for me is not only libido, you all, all, also talk about this in your book, but also like uh, volition and the human will, because that's for me a, a, a basic phallic um, Uh, attribute you have to accept reality you have to make distinctions you have to be you know you have you have to use the reality principle to act in the world as you know uh, as a male or, or masculine force and so that's will for me as opposed to the more love and unconditional love thing of the mamilla so is that something yeah. that you would also describe in that way or would you Oh, well, how, how it, to a certain talk? point, because you remember you got a magical gaze when you were born. It wasn't your mother. It's very, very important that it isn't your mother. It's the midwife or usually the grandmother or something like that that meets you for the first time. And you do get the unconditional love from that smile, but that body does not represent unconditional love in itself. Right. Because that body just released you and you associate, therefore, the pain you went through when you were born with that smile. 
So pain and smile. But if you go through the pain and can handle it, you can then have the smile at the end, meaning you can take on challenges. That's very important. But it's not your mother's smile. You don't even see your mother's smile. You crawl to the mother's tit. You end up with the mamilla. And then you look at the mother's smile eventually. When that smiles at you, and that's the unconditional love, until the mother starts looking at the phallus. And then it loves something else. And that means the unconditional love of the mother is divided. Oh, mother loves something else, which is the sexual attraction, the eros, whereas I can only get the agape, the, the, the divine love from the mother. So we start disassociating these things already at that stage. But what happens later is that we discover is that the elderly are all in that amor fat realm. The elderly all have the phallic gaze. So the older woman's magical gaze is phallic. So the woman has left the reproduction cycle. The woman no longer gives birth to children. That's exactly what we live until we're 70, 80 years old. You know, way after we've given birth to children. Women live on average, even in ancient society, live on average 30 to 40 years longer than the period when they give birth to children because they became grandmothers and they're incredibly, incredibly important. Now, here's the difference between phallus and matrix when we get older. Uh, We are a tribe and we're on the move. So we have to move from point A to point B at all times. That means somebody has to lead and somebody has to pick up the slack at the end and make sure everybody follows. This is exactly what the patriarchs and the matriarchs do. So the job between them is, is divided. But it also means that the patriarchy, because it leads... It leads the entire tribe. The, the whole story of this is called nomadology, but it, because it leads the tribe, it has to be split because the two different things you lead with. You lead with your body, you physically lead, physiologically, lead, and you lead with your mind. And those are two different archetypes and two different expertises. That's exactly what the chieftain and the priest are separated. Now, this is obvious for leading the other men. So the younger men are being led by the chieftain and the priest, and they must not mix the two together. Because if you mix the chieftain and the priest together, you get the tyrant, and the tyrant might look very impressive in the short run, but will be a disaster in the long run. And that's exactly what the fake fallacies throughout history are tyrants. They're the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Maos. And it starts already with Knotten of Egypt, 1300 before Christ. It was the first major dictator in history. And they look very stunning. They always look very stunning. They have these mass meetings and all the guys look up to them. because It's like, it's like they're both a military and the priest at the same time. But all the cultures that try to unify the military and the priest only last for a long time. It's usually very destructive. It becomes a dictatorship and then they fail. So phallus is split. And phallus is split between chieftain and priest. It doesn't mean that my phallus is split. It just means that I either aspire to be chieftain, which the majority of men will do, or I aspire to become priest-like, which a minority of men will do. But say on average, nine men out of 10 try to strive towards the chieftain and one man out of 10 strive towards the priest. But you only need a smaller group of priests and monks. You need a larger group of chieftains and soldiers and hunters for the tribe to work. But that's how the entire tribe moves. And if you take, for example, the exodus out of Egypt that kickstarted Judaism, it's always the story about the three siblings. It's Moses and Aaron and Miriam. It's a perfect example. Aaron is the chief king. He leads the people all the way into the promised land. The priest, Moses, writes the script. He meets God. He delivers the law. He does all these things around them and puts the strategy forward to them. But he actually literally dies on a mountain before they enter the promised land because his job is finished by the time they arrive. And then he appoints one of the 12 sons of Israel, Levi, and the tribe of Levi, to not have any territory, but rather take responsibility for the entire territory as a priesthood of all the other tribes. I Meaning the Levites do not get any land, but instead they're paid a small sum, a tenth, or what the others make, to then be the communicators between the other tribes. This is the beginning of nationalism. This is the beginning of understanding a larger, more complex picture. So the priesthood is usually about a tenth of the entire uh, outer circuit of, of men. And, and the majority of men, say nine tenths, belong to, belong to the chieftain and soldier and hunter structure. And they lead. 
Now, the matriarchs don't have to be two. You only need one matriarch at the very end. And in all the studies, so the that I do before we wrote it, is the libido went to all these tribes in the jungle, went to the tribes in, you know, in, in the Arctic, we went to highlands, we went to river valleys. We just looked everywhere in the world and found the same pattern everywhere. There is always this older woman everybody's terrified of. <laughs> and she's always at the center of your imagination. Right. Like center of the tribe is the matriarch. So the oldest woman, the wisest woman who's been around the longest, who's not impressed by anything. You know, she's like a Margaret Thatcher personality, right? She doesn't care what you think of her. She tells you what she thinks and she's connected with reality. And then she gives you a kick in the butt if you don't move. That's right. Miriam in, in the Jewish mythology. That's the older sister of Aaron and, and Moses. And she walks at the very back and you all know that you may not walk behind her because there's nothing of the chaos behind her. You're dead if you're behind her. So you get a chance to walk ahead of her, even if you're a child, even if you're a pregnant woman. Anybody can walk at the speed where you can still be ahead of the matriarch. She will not walk any faster than that, but she will force you every morning to get up on your feet and walk. And she will ask the priest in the evening to give you a story about how the tribe is on the move the next morning. So all these Netflix series, these HBO series and television, everything we do as a tribe or a family in the evenings, is all about a story about how we must be on the move the next day to survive. Right. Let's so that's what the matter does. So, so the phallic is really the leadership that leads us and guides us into the future. And the chieftain has his spies. And and, 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 and and the priest has, you know, he has his representatives out there, the diplomats out there, who are trying to find out where we need to go next. Right. So let us, let us go from that times to our times now. Yeah. You know, so there's a well-documented hatred or rejection, ressentiment of, of postmodern and postmodernist thinking against yeah. all phallic i could say or masculine yes. uh, hierarchy so so first like what is it and where does it come from from your point of view well to begin with it is incredibly dangerous okay the most dangerous periods of history we've experienced are the ones where the the faith in phallus has been lost completely or phallus is completely ignored number one because biologically young men are still looking for phallus And that just means you're just tapping up the interest for them to look for it in a more desperate way. And that's exactly what we need to identify the authentic and the fake fallacies at times like this. So we can take Islamism, for example. It's not exclusively a phenomenon that would happen in the Islamic world. Uh, the, you know, the West, the Europe and America has also had its own terror sects and stuff like that in the past. And we certainly had them in the 1930s. So that's dangerous. We live in very dangerous times. We live in apocalyptic times. You know, you know, you get a few crises, economic crises, pandemics and things like that. It doesn't take too much for the very, very, very thin structure we operate with in our society for it to fall through and for the fake fallacies to run amok. And then we have the fake messiahs and the fake fallacies everywhere. That's historic what's happened. That's why what, that's what Digital Libido is a dark book. And this is central message of the book. It's one huge warning. We need to get fallacies back. To begin with, let's understand why we became so incredibly anti-phallic. Well, go back to 1945. Hitler and Stalin had in between them killed a hundred million people. It didn't get much better that a guy called Mao mimicked them and then repeated the same thing in China 20, 30 years later and killed another 50 to 60 million people in China as well. So the problem here is the same in China as in Russia, as in Europe. And, and what we dealt with then is that America took on a role as the only phallic structure in the world because it won the Second World War in 1945. It, it, yeah, the Americans did sacrifice themselves, but considering that 100 million people died in Europe, it was more like a walkover. And, you know, the atomic bomb helped. So America basically controlled and ruled the world in 1945. Stalin got his shit together a few years later and created some kind of fake phallic opponent to America. But... The idea that phallic power, that strong men were good for the world was more or less dead. 
you'd have millions of women who'd seen their husbands die in the war and their sons die in the war. And they were suddenly out there working, trying to make their own money. And, you know, they were becoming professionals. They were getting higher education starting in the 1940s. And it's completely understandable that feminism took root. And feminism is essentially the understanding that because men are no longer supporting women, women have to support themselves. The way it was constructed, of course, was that men got to work really hard and pay taxes. The taxes went into the government coffers and then the government would then pay more money to the women. So eventually, you know, the exchange is the same anyway. But, but you know, women have made their careers. They worked hard. They made lots of achievements. Undeniably, that's what happened. But what then happened was that the ideal modernism, which was a very phallic vision, Modernism started with enlightenment in the 17th century. Uh, if you would only become rational human beings, and if you became rational and logical rather than mythical, we could eventually overwin, you know, overcome everything and science could pr- create a better world. And because in the 19th century, we did achieve that in Europe. Europe basically colonized and plundered the planet, but it also became increasingly wealthy, had a fast population growth, populated three more continents in the process. And undeniably, the 19th century was a massive golden age for European imperialism and colonialism. So out of that came the First World War in 1912. When the different European empires went to war with each other, they were all so high in themselves, they thought this war would be over in no time at all, and, they, and both sides would win. And of course, the numbers didn't add up. This entire modernist project that was supposed to be so logical and rational collapsed in 1913 completely in an irrational exuberance. The narcissism involved when Germany and France and England and and, and Britain and and, and Russia went to war with one another was just complete mayhem. There was no logic and no rationality at all. It was the complete and utter, uh, you know, Overemphasis of nationalism, this, this belief that nation and empire unified in some kind of absurd power game where you, nobody could lose. And of course, it led to the implosion of the First World War. That led to the first urge of postmodernism. The first reaction against modernism was the 1920s. And in the 1920s, it wasn't like philosophers said it, you know, or like culture caught up with it, but the complete decadence that happened in the 1920s, there was an incre- incredibly anti-phallic era, led, for example, almost to a communist revolution in Germany that failed. It later became a communist revolution instead in Russia. Uh, but it also then led to national socialism, the rise of national socialism in Germany. So if anything, we should look at the 1920s, we will look at the 2020s today, and we should be warned that if we don't take back the phallus, the authentic phallus, and start to understand the authentic phallus, we're leaving society as a playing field completed to fake phalluses. This is a central message of digital libido. And what then happened was, of course, the second world war happened. What first started as a tragedy, the first world war, was then repeated as a farce, as Karl Marx used to say. So the farce, you know, the ultimate tragedy was the Second World War. Now, after the atomic bomb went off in August 1945, and the old empires of Japan and Germany and Italy were exposed, and so was Stalin and Russia eventually, for all the horrors that they created, and for Auschwitz and everything they created, and the hundreds of millions of people that had died, we didn't want any more of that. It's completely understandable that modernism was over. So you picked up any of the philosophers from the 1930s, especially these German Jews called the Frankfurt School, you know, Horkheimer, Dorner, who dealt with modernism and basically said that tyranny where we arrived was actually built into modernism from the very beginning because modernism didn't understand its own limitation. It didn't understand the irrational ground on which it was built. And that irrational ground is this pathic, uncontrolled libido that doesn't understand itself. And that confusion is what we tried to, to not, try to overcome. The problem was we just ended up in the other ditch because starting in the 1970s with, you know, the oil embargo, with stagflation in the economy, where, you know, all the West suddenly going much more corrupt and decadent, is that we haven't really seen much of a growth or much of a belief in the future in the 1970s. I, I would say that the death of the American dream that Donald Trump personifies today started in the 1970s. 
Peter Thiel, for example, agrees on this as well in America, if you want to check out Peter Thiel. So we have the same perspective. In the 1970s, that's when the problem started. And that's the golden era of postmodernism. And everything was supposed to be playful. And when you look at postmodernism, it really is a world of a child and a woman playing with a child in a way. You know, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's like a world where really grown-up men are gone. They're no longer there. They're not supposed to be around any longer. It's become a very childish world. It's become something we call the Peter Pan syndrome world. The world of the 11-year-old who fantasizes what it's like to be grown up, but he doesn't want to become a grown-up. He doesn't want to become a grown-up man and take the responsibility that it means to have an authentic phallus. So he stays an 11-year-old and tries to sneak in in the grown-up world and take the best parts out of it, but still keep his, his rights to be a little boy and a child and be irresponsible. Well, well, I think we have to uh, point out that it is a metaphor, you know, because uh, a postmodernist would certainly disagree with that. But the, the point when, when I'm thinking about this is like when I'm thinking about postmodernity and postmodernity in our time, it's about the idea that everything has to be equal and there's social justice and there's this idea of universal basic income, you know, everything yeah. has to be equally distributed. And the that is, but that, do you just, that is Peter Pan syndrome is right there. The name for Peter Pan is the teenager. And the teenager was invented by marketing people in America in the 1950s. I told you America became the global superpower way before it was mature enough to have it. To be honest about it. Not that Europe had done a much better job before that, but if you look at it realistically, America got the job of running the world. And what America did in 1950 was it started to celebrate the young, sexy body instead of celebrating wisdom. All the stuff you and I are doing these days, and you and I are doing with Andrew Sweeney, and the stuff that Dan, John Favark and Jordan Peterson, these guys are talking about in North America, and all, all this sort of return to wisdom that's going on at the moment, this, this, this urge to return to well, wisdom. Well, it's funny that it's you mentioned Jordan Peterson. Because, po- because, because he, po- he, postmodernism, postmodernism doesn't value wisdom at all. It, doesn't, it precisely values the youthful energy and the idea that you can start creating without having much of an experience. You can just, you can just be child to happily create things. And, and even if you're not mature enough yet to understand what you're doing, if you don't have the knowledge to know what you're doing, you're, what you do is still valued on a par with that of the expert. That's exactly what postmodernism is a celebration of, the, of, of Peter Pan because it's a celebration that all narratives are equally valued. You must not value them differently. Um, and that in itself is an absurdity because to say that all narratives are equally valued is in itself to declare a superior narrative. Sure. It's a performative contradiction. Yes. Exactly. Postmodern Hegel would expose postmodernism in two seconds and say postmodernism contradicts itself in its very foundation because actually different narratives are different values because they're different truth qualities. And that's why Sedeckis and I are adamant about the truth quality the relevance qualities, John Favarki would say, of a narrative determines its value. So is this great logos? Is it good science, for example? Or is this great mythos? Is it a really good story? It's a story that's worth being told. Should we give it money and make it into a movie? Should we just throw it away, for example? Is it worth being a theater piece? Should we just throw it away? Is it fake or is it authentic? Okay, and the same thing with pathos. Pathos is about sexuality. Pathos is about art. Pathos is about violence. But is it real? Or is it just a fake variety of it? That those things are incredibly important for us human beings to orientate ourselves properly in the world. So how do we do that? Give, give us an example in terms of, say, capitalism. Because, you know, when, when we talk about capitalism, and you did that, you know, in terms of modernity and enlightenment, this is a complete phallic endeavor, like from, from the outset, you know, because it taps so deeply into our phallic mind that we can achieve something and then we can build something and then we get something for that back and it's like it taps into into this kind of uh, adventurous spirit that we have. And at yeah. the same time, uh, what, what postmodernity did was to expose all the fallout from that if we don't, you know, if, if we don't treat it carefully. And so, but then you have like this postmodern rejection of, of, of capitalism uh, at the same time with ideas like universal basic income, which from my point of view completely uh, 
goes out out of the limb not not you know it, it doesn't work like that so how no. how would you recon reconcile for a, a post postmodern age like these kinds of what what could a new phallus bring to a world after postmodernism is well to I begin guess, where we got to recognize where these ideas come from universal basic income is the dream that mamilla has returned there's an infinite amount of breast milk for everybody at all times Bullshit. That's just called hyperinflation. So that won't work. Uh, no, uh, let's go back and see where the critique actually fails. The critique fails because capitalism, as we understand it, is built on individualism. So the religion we preach for the last 400 years since the 17th century is individualism. Postmodernism never manages to get out of that. It's still stuck in that mindset. So what individualism said that by creating a society where we focus on each individual, being perfected as an individual. So liberalism said, we, we're going to create the means through the market forces so that everybody could achieve everything they wanted to do in their lives. And socialism came along and said, no, 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 that's not going to work. We're going we're gonna to put most of the resources into government's hands and the government is going to dictate how you become a really successful individual. And then you become an individual. But all of these different political movements that we live with from the 1600s forward, are all within the same religious dogma, and it's called individualism. And postmodernism is still stuck there. Postmodernism is still based on the idea that society as a whole is a constant struggle between eight billion individuals who are at each other's throats, ready to kill each other, fighting, but no longer fighting for who works the hardest or who makes the most money, But rather with postmodernism, we write a stage where it's only a fight of who's going to get the attention. And that's because postmodernism has arrived with the internet age and social media, and suddenly everybody has their own megaphone, they have their own smartphone, and what do they do? They still believe in a mistaken belief called individualism. They still believe that if I don't scream at the top of my lung all the time, I will not get attention. So I will scream scream at the top of my lungs, and that's exactly what we in digital libido says, that the mess we've arrived in is a state we call hyper-narcissism. So we arrived at the tragic supernova end of individualism. That's exactly why postmodernism is not the solution to the problem of modernism. Postmodernism is rather the tragic end of modernism and also the dangerous end of modernism because we now have to rethink what it means to actually build a new world. Well, the well, way we build a new world cannot be individually, cannot be about you building or me building. It has to go back to nomadology and understand how human beings operate. And it's teamwork and it's tribal and it's about subcultures. And that is the response against both individualism and collectivism because both individualism and collectivism failed. Postmodernism was the mess we got into. And the only way out of that is to go back to tribalism. There's a there's a strand of postmodernism, or like there are some postmodernists that would say, well, um, that the idea of the individual is a social construct, right? Yeah, and, and, it, and it, that, it, that postmodernity is about dogma, yeah. vegetarianism and you know what kind of race I am or what kind of uh, subculture I belong to. It's more about groups and and how groups. No, it's not. It's not. No, I. I, 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 I disagree. I disagree. I, I, I hear your argument, but I disagree strongly. And why I cut you short is that every one of those arguments says that I, as a member of a certain identity, needs attention. Right. Okay. And I deserve attention. It, it, it's interesting, but if you, if you look at crowdsourcing among social justice warriors, it always fails. <laughs> okay. Maybe if they pick up some money for Bernie Saunders because he does have a wider audience and he's much more of an intellectual than most of them are. But if you look at social justice warriors themselves, they all say, I've got five different hair colors and I was ugly at school and I was bullied when I was 11 and I've got three different sexual orientations and I can't make out of my mind, I can't make anything out of my life that has value to anybody else, but I still want all this attention. I deserve it because I'm special. Now, that sounds like a two-year-old to me, right? So mm. the problem with postmodernism is never left individualism. If postmodernists seriously claim that they're about group identity, then why don't they fight for these groups? But they don't. Now, all they do is they fight for victimhood. So they, they, they fight for the right to appoint themselves as victims individually because they belong to a group that is permanently victimized. 
Now, the problem with that is that that's why Thomas Sowell and these guys are the best critics you can find of postmodernism. I highly recommend Thomas Sowell here because the, the problem is that once you identify yourself as a victim, you become your own enemy. And if you identify, you become, you're part of a group that has a certain identity with identities permanently associated with victimhood and nothing else. You dig the grave for the entire group. You can never rise because of that. The only way to rise is to get out of the search for the mamela and search for the universal basic income and search for somebody else to pay your bills and search for nobody, never taking responsibility for yourself, anybody else, and just pushing that responsibility onto somebody else, a government or some power broker somewhere out or some evil guy who still takes responsibility for you so you don't have to grow up. No, the only way out of postmodernism is to go for the phallic gaze. So the phallic, to go the for phallic, the phallic case, case never would them, themselves view as a victim of certain the fa- circumstances. The phallic case would never accept you appointing yourself as a victim. Right. The phallic case would tell you, yes, you were unfortunate. Yes, you had accidents in your life. You were miserable. But it doesn't matter. If you view yourself as a victim, you'll become your own worst enemy. And the only thing you can do at any given time in your life is to completely accept reality as it is and do the best you can with the life you have not only for yourself, but for others. But it starts with yourself because you cannot support and help others unless you help yourself first. So it's because like you, you mentioned uh, Nietzsche, yeah. that's Amor Fati, to accept yes. reality as it is, to accept fate, yes. you know, and to play on that field, you know, that you yes. have. Yeah, so, so to seek Amor Fati is to seek the phallic gaze. And this is ultimate of phallus represents to us today. And that's a phallus is the name on that which opposes postmodernism. And yes, it means we go back to the Renaissance. It means we go back to the Enlightenment. It means we need a new narrative of a new, better world that we can create. And that narrative this time around has to be global by scope. It has to include the East and the West. It has to include all cultures because we now live in a global world. Right. It, it also has to include both the new digital world and, and the physical world that we live in already. So it has, to, it has to be East, West, and digital at the same time. Without it, it's not a proper new grand narrative. It will not replace modernism and postmodernism. And we're running short of time because we will stay in this sort of postmodernist quagmire and we cannot get out of it until we establish a new grand narrative. And the beginning of that is to understand the need for it. So let us let us be a little bit more lighthearted. How yeah. uh, where would you locate uh, what Jordan Peterson did in all of this? Because uh, obviously he uh, argued for a more phallic lifestyle, a yeah. more phallic responsibility and wisdom, and all of that. But at yeah. the same time, his critique of postmodernity was kind of flat or short. You know, it was like. Um, And I would he, say I would say his critique against postmodernism was relevant, but his critique against the post-structuralist was not. So in our work with me and Sadekist, you find Derrida, you find uh, Levinas, you find certainly Lacan and, and, and Deleuze and Christeva and Foucault. I mean, all these brilliant post-structuralists that came out of Europe and today it is Zizek and Badiou and Stolterdijk and the other guys. We use all of them. They're all great thinkers and philosophers. And Jordan Peterson just throws them away from a sort of American college perspective. And, and of course, that disqualified him from a serious debate on philosophy. He, he clearly showed his weakness there. But his response against American postmodernism was highly relevant. The misreading reading of post-structuralism that arrived and became a mass movement called postmodernism, which today is manifested by social justice warriors, for example. That critique is highly, highly relevant. And, and I'm really sick of all this talk about self-appointed victimhood. I think it's incredibly destructive. There's nothing good about it, at least not for the people who go for that discourse and try to use it as a kind of blackmail against the rest of society. So that, no, we, we should get resources. We should get breast milk. We should get dollars. We should get euros as a compensation for uh, everything we've gone through that is horrible. And, and we demand this, right? And the question is, well, how long is that begging process going to continue? Because it seems that begging process is set to continue forever. So if it isn't about getting means to help yourself get out of your predicament, which is the only help that works, any parent knows that about children. So if this means that you're going to get resources from the rest of us forever for being uh, appointed a victim by yourself, 
not by us, then why would we ever be part of that process? It, right. just, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and in that sense, postmodernism is killing itself. I'm not afraid of postmodernism in itself. It cannot really do any good. It cannot really be powerful at the end. It can only protest. It can only put you know, the placards up there and do the protest, but it cannot really take over and run society. But it can cause a lot of havoc. And the worst thing is it opens up for the next wave. And the last time that happened in the 1930s, it was like, it's like you had the old left first, the bitch then complained about reality. And then you got an alt right. And suddenly we had nothing but communism and Nazism in Europe because the two alternatives when Germany and Russia were put against each other in the 1930s was that it's Nazism or it's communism, everything else is gone. And that's exactly what happens after you've gone through a phase of intense postmodernism. Right. There's that's what we're there's doing. This, there's the saying, to put this in an easy phrase, uh, yeah. I don't know if you have heard of that, strong men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make bad times, and bad times make strong men. And there you have the cycle. That's what an older woman would say. That's a typical <laughs> saying of an old matriarch who's been around. And she's seen the men and she loves them and she adores them. But she also knows they can fuck it up really bad. Hmm. Because the problem is that even if the matriarch pushes it forward and she's ultimately responsible for taking care of us, care, Heidegger's care, you know, that's the most beautiful word when it comes to female power. But if the men do not lead and don't know where they're going, if, if, if the spies weren't sent out there by the priest and by the chieftain in advance, so we do not know which territory we walk into, then we're in a really dangerous situation. And the That's less the situation we are in now. Actually. Yes, so because what? nobody talks about the future any longer. Nobody talks about visions. When they talk about the future, they talk about maybe we should go to Mars in a rocket by Elon Musk. And that's, that's not realistic. That's not the future. The future is about who are we going to be? Number one, how are we going to save the planet? Well, you and I talk about equatopianism all the time. Uh, how are we going to say uh, be cosmopolitan in the future so we can love and embrace strangers in a whole new way because otherwise we cannot survive together on this planet? Cosmopolitanism, equatopianism, synthism, all these different utopian ideas that you and I work with all the time. These are ideas to give us a proper vision of where we need to go. So basically right. we're, we're staging out, we're saying that there is definitely new territory for us to walk into as a humanity. There are challenges, even challenges we have created ourselves that need to be solved. And the way to solve them is through technology, that's the chief chain side of it, and through narrative, which is the priestly side of it. And I would say the combination of new innovative technologies and of artificial intelligence that collaborates with human beings, talk about symbiotic intelligence, like the optimal relationship between AI and human beings, and also the narratives, the storytelling that goes with that, That ultimately is where we need to go. And we need to create a functioning patriarchy that does that job. Because the rest, the matriarchy, is already decently functioning at the moment. Uh, but we need a new patriarchy. We need phallic vision more than ever. Right. So that would be, I, that was the thought. Um, so the individual needs, and, and you, you, the individual needs, and you already said that, to, to find and enact uh, the 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 primary two archetypes you know how to how to deal with life how to uh, set up life how to create cha uh, engage chaos and and to create something new and and find a outlook there and this is some everybody can do basically yeah yeah and and, and for the vast majority of people for some 95% of the population, you belong either to the outer circuit or the inner circuit, which is like your inside society itself. So think of it originally as a tribe. And we're working with four, for the new book, we're working with four different formats. The clan is the smallest one. That's the Dunbar number, about 157 people. Then comes the tribe, which is about the size of 1,500 people. Then comes, we've developed later in history, the nation and the empire. And those are the four formats that we can relate to. We have some formats in between, like the city-states that are between nations and, and, and tribes and things like that. But, but yeah, essentially, we work in four different formats that have been developed ideologically, philosophically, theologically even before in the past. We have uh, imperial theory, we have national theory, and we have theories about the tribe and the clan. But the tribe is the fundamental entity that we can relate to. That's why we talk about the new tribalism all the time. So 
says individualism doesn't work and we're just individuals. Each one of us is a individual human being in desperate need of having social connections and being within social networks. And the primary social network for us is the tribe. And collectivism is also died. The idea that, you know, somebody can sit and just, the, you know, whim over their head, dictate of millions of people how to live their lives. Well, that became the Soviet Union at best. And it became, you know, the Khmer or Cambodia at worst. Like, so we don't want any of that collectivism ever again. So to get out of those two mindsets, we need to go back to some sort of tribalism and we then can use the internet and basically ask technology that how would technology today collaborate with human beings to create a phallic vision that works for human beings? So where would contemporary technology meet the tribal mindset of us as human individuals? And the word for that is sensocracy. It's a world full of human senses and a world full of sensors with increasing intelligence. Right. So it's a world of increasing intelligence all the time. And the fun thing is this, all life forms, especially human beings, when you reach a certain amount of intelligence that operates, the will to intelligence in itself has been accomplished. And then it moves into a world to transcendence. And in the new book you're working on right now, which is the third part of this trilogy, we're going to go into dividing the world to power or the libido, if you like, dividing it into a will to transcendence and a will to intelligence. And of course, when it comes to studying phallus, that means the chief tain represents will to transcendence. Right. And the priest represents will to intelligence. And therefore, also the priest is the connection between the chief tain and the matriarch. I think that's, that's perfect because our, uh, the, the, the last two episodes of this miniseries will be exactly about that about transcendence, about spirituality and about power structures and, you know, the sensocracy. Yeah. And so I think that is a good stopping point for now. Yeah, you know? sure. Great.